building Chinese fashion brands. Now this is thoughtful. <laughs> Hello, I'm Trevor Lai in Shanghai. This week on Thoughtful China, we're looking at the challenges facing Chinese fashion brands as they try to expand from the ground up. Also, Jeffrey Buckman, a professor in the Advertising and Marketing Communications Department at New York's Fashion Institute of Technology, will tell us whether the world is ready for Chinese fashion brands. But first, with us is Kinsen Su, Managing Director of Lafayette 148 New York. Kinsen, thanks for joining us. Thanks, Trevor. Now, Lafayette 148 New York has a very interesting story because it's a U.S.-based and U.S.-developed brand, but it's coming to China, and it was built by a Chinese family. Mm. Tell us a bit about your background. Well, um, my father started the company uh, 15 years ago, but way before that, he was, um, he was born in China. He uh, moved to the States. <coughs> he started out as really just, um, just uh, lots of odd jobs. He tried to go to school uh, as an engineer. <coughs> At a certain point, he, he got an opportunity to, um, to uh, run a factory. And we just kept on, he just kept on building and building. And at a certain point, he realized that really, in order to be independent, he had to start his own brand. So, so that's what we did. And for really the last 16 years, we've been building Lafayette, uh, primarily in the United States. <coughs> and, and then this year, we, um, we came here and we opened up here in Shanghai in China. Was there a turning point or at some you know, critical moment in the past few years where you suddenly said, let's come back to China, you know, the, your father's homeland as it would be, and say, well, let's come back here and expand here, rather than, say, continuing your growth in North America and then Europe, et cetera? Being back in China is, is a, is, has been a dream of his uh, all his life. He's always wanted to come back. It was just a question of the right timing. And what is the vision? Tell us about the vision moving forward then for the next 10 years. Do you believe that your brand can be the first truly homegrown uh, Chinese built but international fashion brand? I believe we can. I believe we can. And, I, and, and um, you know, I'm a little bit confident because I'm from New York, but <clears throat> I probably shouldn't say that. But um, I think we do. We have a focus in, in the States on the product and the customer. And I think those, those things, those are the things that, that really shine through uh, for, for any market. So, <clears throat> so I'll give you an example. Like in, in, um, in the United States, when we, when we opened, we were just this tiny, tiny little company in a small little office in Soho, New York, before Soho, New York became cool. Like Soho, New York was just, people weren't, didn't go to, to Soho. And what we did was, and we were competing against these huge competitors. Back, back in the 90s, it was, it was like Dana Buckman, Jones, New York, these, Ann Klein, for, for instance, and these were companies that actually are not even in business anymore. One of our questions actually from a, a LinkedIn member, Julie Zhu, is asking, you know, touching on what you've just said, when a brand is, you know, developing its look and its feel mm -hmm. the for the designer, do they think more about the brand style or the audience? I think that's that's a really good question. It's um, it's a little bit. It's it's. I'm gonna have to answer that both are important, but uh, there is there is a, there is a direction. I think the the brand has to. A brand has to have a style and an identity, and and that's typically chosen by the designer, if it's a designer brand, and and then what you do is so you have you have it, you have an essence, you have a core, you have a DNA, and you tweak to the customers that that respond to it. So they may they may originally like your design. But they, they want things a little bit more trendy. They want some things that are that are that evolve with them, and and then at that point, it's a lot about customer preference. Not to the point where you've completely changed your 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 DNA, so to speak. But you have to you still have to remain relevant to the customer. You have to continue to listen to them. 
So, so there are there are both elements that that are really um, really core to to executing well on on that uh, that vision between the brand style and and customer preference. And at the same time, we've all heard a lot of stories about fashion brands as they enter China. Mm -hmm. You know, some of them that maybe stumble when they first enter. One of their biggest obstacles is really that balance between adaptation uh, and preserving. You know the look and feel, and sometimes mm. you know even technically the sizing, the shaping, and the styles. You know, after having opened your first uh, boutique here, what are some of the learnings that you've you know adapted into perhaps your design process or in how you market to the Chinese consumer here? Sure. Well, I mean the most obvious is the size. So we we immediately had to 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 change all the sizes, which which we do. We have a very deep production background. That stuff actually is very is uh, very doable by, by us. So we, and that's that's to me that's par for the course. It astounds me if, if brands feel like they can just come to China with their with their standard sizing and and expect it to work because the Chinese customer is is unique and unique. But there's still 1.2 billion of them, so it's it's worth it to to adapt to their sizes uh, all over the country, whether they're in the north, northern part of China, southern, western. From a, from a style standpoint, I think one of the, the striking things we, we've, we've found is that the customer is much younger than our customer in the States. Um, our customer in the States is, is much more established, whereas in China, I think the, the you know, there's, um, there's just a woman who's, who's very much entering into the prime of, of the China wave, so to speak. And, um, and she's still looking for a sense of fashion. She's finding it a little bit in magazines and, and, and what other countries are doing, but she's still uniquely Chinese. One of the other th and then one of the other things we found is that they are they're much less formal here. So for instance, our core customer is, 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 is a professional Chinese woman who, who feels like she needs to, to look professional at the office and yet be able to go out into, uh, into these networking dinners and, and, and meeting clients and so on and so forth without looking overly formal. So she doesn't, she doesn't, she doesn't go for the whole suit pant look, whereas that's our bread and butter. Uh, in the United States. So it sounds like your brand is really embracing the concept and living the concept of a global brand. Thanks, Kinson. Sure. Thanks, Trevor. Now here's Jeffrey Buckman with a thought or two about what local designers need to know about Western consumers. In order for Chinese brands to succeed in the West, they must become true brands, not merely brands in name only. True brands offer an emotional context to the consumer a meaningful relationship. These brands succeed because they communicate an identity, a personality, a compelling emotional differentiation from the competition. What can Chinese brands offer the Western consumer? There are many unique and meaningful associations she already has with China. Icons, colors, graphics. The Art Deco chic of the 20s and 30s to the high-tech hipsters of today. Importantly, there's a uniquely Chinese way of looking at the world, of relating to one's surroundings. This speaks to an aesthetic that can be used to position and differentiate Chinese fashion. What do Chinese brands need to know about the Western consumer? The answer is simple, the execution very challenging. Western fashion consumers want to have relationships with the brands they value. They want more than satisfaction from fashion. They're seeking delight. How to do this? First, go into the market and research. Not just the consumer, but the environmental factors that influence her. Spend time in the marketplace. Second, Identify a group of these consumers large enough to support your business objectives, but small enough to create delight. Get to know them well. Third, seek 
strategic partnerships with supply chain members. They are your gateway into the market. Fourth, create brand awareness and identity through imagery and brand elements. Differentiate your brand. Fifth, use integrated marketing communications to create consumer awareness, interest, and desire for your brand. Invest in the consumer. Sixth, constantly monitor and evaluate the process. The consumer is always changing. You need to change with her. Seventh, repeat as directed. Finally, large established Chinese fashion companies can take a lesson from entrepreneurial, creative, and energetic Chinese designers that have emerged as important brands to younger, fashion-conscious markets in first-tier cities. These designers are exploring new and exciting ways to interpret and find a voice for Chinese style, which is both compelling and original. Though some of these designers have been around since the 90s, they still convey the energy and passion of youth. New ideas expressed in a uniquely Chinese way. This is what the fashion-conscious Western consumer wants. Thanks, Jeffrey. With me now are two Chinese fashion designers, Masha Ma and Ji Chen, as well as Alton Chao, Managing Director of Chloe Chen. Your three labels took very different paths. So can you talk a little bit about your business models and how you started the brands? Ji? Um, actually, I found my, my own brand in 2003, and uh, I was fascinating all of the Chinese cultures, elements. So the most of style I want to create for my own brand is the blend of the, 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 the inspiration from Chinese elements and then put them in chic and uh, modern weight. So the model, the business model actually for me is quite small right now and we are just trying to find the more uh, good department stores to make the shops look proper. Because now, right, right now, most of my shop is uh, like a street shop. It's uh, quite a small and, uh, and I do the two different kind of uh, line. One is um, ready to wear and another one is uh, wedding gowns. So actually the requirement from my customer, they try to looking for some dresses and wedding gowns. So I just develop another line to do the service to them. Hey, Masha. Hello there, thank you for having me. Um, uh, I started in London actually. I, I went to London when I was really young. I studied there about Oh, I lived there for 13 years already, and we originally started a studio in London after I graduated from Central St. Martins from the MA. And we showed in London, and then we had a PR in Paris, and then we just decided to ship the entire studio to Paris. And we started in China last July. We had our first studio in The Bound in Shanghai, and we started decorating everything from the scratch from July, and then now we're having around 28 employees in Shanghai, and we have uh, people in office and everything in Paris in between, so traveling around. Alton? Well, the brand was uh, originally started by my wife, Chloe Chen, and it, it started actually in Taiwan as a kind of a select shop. It was something that was an interest for my wife to kind of vent her fashion design needs. And as the brand, as the stores grew, uh, what happened was it kind of evolved very organically in which uh, she had opportunities to design shoes because she couldn't find shoes so then it ended up she would be designing her own shoes and then that then gravitated designing her own clothes and now Chloe Chen is about 90 percent all designed by Chloe with some minor brands of accessories and stuff that are uh, brought in that are primarily due to relationships that we have with these with these designers and the brand actually started in uh, 2000, so it's been about 12 years since the brand's been open. Um, we have about six locations in Taiwan, primarily in uh, retail centers as well as uh, street venues. Uh, in China, we've been around for about five years and we have three locations and we're currently in the process of uh, expanding our operations and actually in, in the process of reinventing the brand. Uh, one of the big things that's been happening with us is uh, because of our clientele has, is actually from Taiwan and from China, uh, you know, Chinese people are getting more and more international, so the, the draw for a Chinese brand has been expanding. 
and we've actually had some opportunities to now uh, show in Paris Fashion Week. So we've been, uh, we just started doing that, and then <clears throat> we're also looking to kind of expanding into the U.S. market. Well, speaking on that, um, you know, we're interested to hear about your opinions in terms of Chinese designers. And Masha, I'll start with you, with your unique background, actually spending time and going to school, um, you know, in abroad and actually building your brand abroad first before you expanded here. Did you find it was easier because of the trendiness, so to speak, of Chinese fashion, culture, and economically speaking, to actually build your brand in the past few years? I don't know. I think my experience is very unique. I, I believe everybody's experience is very unique at the end of the day. I think it's, I started in London because I, I think simply because of the aesthetics point of view and my designs and what I enjoy doing. And then it becomes more like a brand later on and then we start to have more strategies about everything. We start in Shanghai that as a sample room basically. We didn't really even plan that much that we thought, okay, we are requested more and more by the major media right now. We probably need to little place here. And it starts so quickly with all the expansion. We are in suddenly in department stores and we're suddenly having more department stores and then we're suddenly going to have second line <laughs> and, and it becomes really fast and rapidly. And Ji, in addition to your work with your brand, you also are the chairwoman of Shanghai Fashion Week. Can you talk to us about how you've observed fashion trends evolving in China differently than you might see abroad? Mm. Yeah, it's been 10 years for Shanghai Fashion Week and I most in, I involved with all, every season. Uh, I, th I feel like now we are, for the, like I'm, I'm based in Shanghai and uh, looking out outside of Shanghai and you know, I'm now I'm showing my collection in London uh, for a second time. And I feel like the, the show actually developing uh, more mature in London or in Paris, but Shanghai still try to find a way how to make this more international. Because it's quite difficult for, for us to invite the international media to come over to China and to look at all these young Chinese designers. You mean they'll come here, here if there's a big Chanel or yeah, Louis Vuitton exactly, show, yeah. but when you're trying to promote local Chinese designers, yeah. it's hard to attract it's them. It's hard to attract them, so that's why I had a conversation with the organizations. I just asked them is to have the solutions to improve this part because if Shanghai Fashion Week want to become in the part of the international fashion week, we need to have the international medias who care about the fashion and the trends. We're not talking by ourselves, it's your own voice. Sure. You know, we need um, the, the public involved more. And what are some of the solutions that, that you think might help, you know, the first, forward. first of all, we need a good PR, like Masha said, you know, the, the, the international brands, when they establish the brand in any countries, so the things they have to hire a PR, it's same including the Fashion Week, they need their own international PR in London or in Paris, it doesn't matter, but who can invite all these international media yeah. to come over? and uh, to take care of this, be attention to the shows or to the Chinese designers. And Alton, you actually talked a little bit about how right now for Chloe Chen, you are looking at repositioning or perhaps positioning the brand for further growth. Mm -hmm. And you know, as PR and marketing, especially on the digital and social landscape, is that an area that you're putting a lot of focus in? Well, you know, Chloe Chen has been a, a brand that has actually been more of a, of a love child of Chloe's. You know, it's, it, it, it was never started out as, you know, uh, waking up one day and we're going to do a fashion brand that's going to start and we're going to go here, and we're going to go there, we're going to go there. It started out with basic fundamental interest of Chloe wanting to do things that she liked. And the brand has always been revolving around that, how we opened the first store, how we went from Shanghai to Taiwan, I mean from Taiwan to Shanghai actually, how, how now we're expanding into Europe, even how we went to Europe. Europe was more of a, an opportunity through friends who saw the value of what we were doing and introduced us to the right people to give us these opportunities, that now leading to some opportunities in the U.S. When you talk about social media, that's also been something where it also organically grew. Um, Chloe's not a big computer person. I mean, she doesn't, uh, you know, know how to do all, all, all the programming and Outlook and email, but, but I think what's been very valuable about social media is that it's been very accessible. You know, you can do it on your phone, you can do it on things. And what's that, 
been able to do is it's allowed an outlet for Chloe to um, show parts of her life. And I think that's been very important for our brand because for people who are interested in the brand Chloe Chen, they're also interested in Chloe. You know, why is it like this? You know, why, why, are her, you know, why do her designs come out a certain way? Also, is largely affected by the way she lives her life, her, the way she looks at life. So I think it's been very beneficial for us. And, you know, right now we're, we're very active on Facebook. We have a very large following. Chloe has a blog on Yahoo Taiwan, which is ranked at least top three every month consistently. Um, in all of Taiwan. Uh, we're in Weixing, Weibo, you know, we're, we're thinking about doing Twitter. I, I'm even thinking about, you know, getting into it and leaving some comments. So I think it's been a very helpful, and I think it's been a very good avenue for us to kind of get the word out. And I think that's been a large result of how we've been able to kind of expand into other markets. Well, it's interesting. Masha, I'd be in interested to hear your opinion as a you know, up and coming brand in your own right. Do you sometimes get overwhelmed with balancing obviously your creative focus, but now also, as you were saying, as the business matures and as the brand matures, you have to take into consideration how do you divide your time up with managing your social profile, with your branding, your PR, all of these things that actually might distract you from your core interest and passion. Well, I think Chloe is a very lucky girl that she could find you to help that. <laughs> 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 she had to um, marry me for yeah. that. Yeah, I know, I know, but even that is a luck. <laughs> like, like you don't really just randomly on the street and you bump into this person and you're just like, that's the one, you know. So I think gradually it's like with all the successful designers in the past, whether it's Saint Laurent or they all have their very close up couple, Valentino, you know, they have. They're, they're their business partners, you know, they, they, they do everything for them. They can keep creatively very separated and very straightforward. And so that allows them to do everything. So that is something that only happens when it happens. You can't really, you know, that kind of person, you can't really pay for that. You can't really just say, I'm going to have a salary for that. And not exactly going to work out the way you really want it to. So um, let's just put hold on that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so if I can't find that person, obviously I'm going to have a manager or someone helping me, but I, at the end of the day, I have to focus on everything. That it is your own brand and it does request the full attention. For example, the social media you just said, that it's hugely important in this generation, even in the next 10 years or decades. It is the new way of communicating on a different level with, you know, now we're speaking English, and, and uh, but next generation is speaking social language. That's a completely different way of talking to each other. Burberry just built this new store in London that was completely, you know, analyzing with social media and everything's linked to one and only device, which is a mobile phone. And I think it's going to the direction that if you don't have an idea about what e-commerce, your online merchandising is, I really don't know what you're going to do for the next five years sales. We are, for example, collaborating with American group that <coughs> rebuilding our entire social media system. As you said, you have Facebook, Twitter, and uh, Tumblr, they all serve a different purpose, to rebuild your image online that whether you decide to have a Facebook product page or your uh, personal page. Uh, it is <coughs> a new way to uh, filter down the image, which is, was only on the paper or on the printing, on the, on, on the magazine before. And now it's so easy to get to it. And, and, yeah, and it's, we, very it's, it's very accessible. It's, it's very yeah. accessible. And it's unbelievable how fast it is. That it takes 20 seconds for people to know and what's happening with you. you know? So it's, it's, it's very exciting and fascinating. And you know, one of the things I find to be really, really interesting about the social media is that you know, people, people knock it a lot for being very flippant and very immediate and lacking a lot of depth. But I think if used the right way, it actually provides a soul for, for your brand. Right. You know, it, it offers a separate dimension. It's ongoing conversation that yeah. typically in traditional media, you couldn't have that before exactly. when it was one way advertising. So I'm wondering, gee, when you're working with these independent designers or these young designers in China and trying to help them build their brands. Is part of your job really teaching them about what Alta and Amasha have said is that it's really the designer now come entrepreneur has to really have both these sides of the personalities to succeed. Well, uh, I totally agree the social media is part because I was asking this question to a professional advertising company. They, I said, you know, as the size of the we are, and we, we're not going to spend lots of time, uh, money and um, you know, cost to advertising in the public way and all the big brands way, what we can do. And he strongly suggests to using the social media like Weibo because all the fans, all the followers, they're more focused on what they like. If like the people choose me, they really like me. If they choose Chloe or Masha, you know, they'd be their fans. It's more supportive, so just like a small club, and uh, you know the talk about e-magazines or 
or magazines. The, so sometimes, you know, how many, like I have, um, right now I have like almost 30,000 follows. Just, you know, take so quick if I have some information to tell them and they just, you know, can give me. And they spread it to their networks yeah, as well. Yeah, and it's amazing, like I needed some helper in Paris and just using my Weibo. And the, some people will say, ah, oh, I'm here, I can offer this help. It's just like, you know, in, in one day you get lots of people and you get what you need. And I, I'm quite proud of that because all the people who choose you, they really, I have to say, uh, it's touched me sometimes the way they help you. Sure. Well, and on that note, one of our Sina Weibo fans wrote in a question, and York Liu asked, with all the young domestic, you know, very small shops and very small designers not being able to have a physical storefront, um, they're seeing a lot of stores opening on Taobao, mm -hmm. etc. How important do you think um, it is for a physical presence now, or is Taobao and e-commerce going to more and more take over as a a real viable sales channel for brands. Well, you know, it, it's funny because <clears throat> as we as we start to enter, well, not as we start to enter, as we're well into the kind of digital age and social media, and it, it, it's interesting because human contact is actually a commodity. You know, the ability to be able to interact with somebody, to talk to people, to have conversation, you know, I, I equate it to kind of eating out. You know, if, I, if I'm at home and, I'm a, and I can cook really well by myself and I can eat by myself, what's the need to go out and, and have dinner outside? It's the ability to be able to interact, to be around other people. And I think having that physical presence, being able to go to a store, touch the clothes, interact with the salespeople, it, it's, it's, a, it's a social exercise that really needs to happen. Just It's a human need that you need to have. So I think having that physical store is really important. And you know, that actually goes very closely in line with how we train our staff. Like you know, people in our stores, we teach them how to style, how to suggest clothing, how to you know, da pay, you know, mix and match things so that customers are able to walk away with the experience of not just going there, buying something off a rack and cashing out like a grocery store, but that they're actually learning something, that they're getting, there's some type of enhancement. And I think you can't really, it's very difficult to do that online. With all of the more mature fashion centers, um, you know, there's always this talk of New York style or Milan style and Paris style. Do you see a point where, or is it even happening now, where Shanghai style is starting to you know crystallize or do you think that it's still a real fusion of the foreign influences uh, with a bit of Chinese influence but hasn't really carved out its own unique um, look? I think sh for me I think Shanghai style is always there because I'm a Shanghainese and I uh, uh, have to say for even like 1920s you know uh, when you look about look all the pictures this Shanghai style was there and now it's there are more and more movies show about the Shanghai styles and I believe if you know if you dressing in some kind of way the people will say it kind of looks like a, you know old Shanghai styles even not only the fashion it's like furniture people like art deco style actually is a Shanghai style um, so I have to say yeah is it, there it is, Shanghai style. There's an identity yeah. there, it's forming. Masha, Jenny, Alton, thanks for being on Thoughtful China. That wraps it up for today. Be sure to subscribe to us on Tudo and YouTube. You can also follow us on Weibo and Twitter and join our LinkedIn group. See you again.